it's a perfect example of how in today's world, there are so many other options for how to convey and present ideas and collaborate on them that are extremely efficient for us. And if anything, the running into limits of like how much we can cognitively process as human beings, we, uh, we suffer from information overload and we need better tools to help streamline what it is that we actually have to consume and, and make decisions on. But in terms of what the technology can do, it's just, it's, a, it's amazing. It's just absolutely incredible. start us off, what got you interested in productivity to begin with? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I've been in productivity for maybe almost two decades now. Um, I uh, was a, uh, I was a CIO for uh, Facebook for almost seven years. And my job there was a productivity of the workforce. Uh, prior to that, um, I was a CIO for another company. And my job there was a productivity of the business. Um, when I go back even to the beginning of my career, uh, a big part of what made me an effective software engineer and engineering leader is uh, I was uh, very jealous of uh, my own and my team's productivity. How much can we get done in the amount of time that we have? And uh, that led me to you know, focus a lot on automation and streamlining things. And um, so it's really been a big part of, of my life, even though uh, it's really been the last uh, four years that I have, you know, really claimed ownership of like, this is the thing I'm focused on right now. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's been a, a big part of my life for a long time. What are the changes you've seen over 20 years? Well, we have a lot more technology now than we did before. So when I, uh, I don't want to date myself too much, but, mm -hmm. you know, coming into the to workforce, um, you know, when, when I did, uh, technology was relatively new. So you had a lot of office automation that was basically looking at things like, okay, we, we used to manage things on paper and here's how we're going to manage it in the digital world. Um, so whether you, you know, take the concept of a doc, document uh, or a file, um, and you basically represent that in a, in a computer. Uh, you know, fast forward another 20 years, we've started to throw that stuff out the window. We don't think about um, files as much as we think about just links to things. Um, even, uh, you know, the technologies like uh, email, what is email? Email is the electronic memoranda. That is basically its history. Um, memoranda are cool when you can only communicate on paper. But when you're in the digital universe, they are completely like way too much overhead. And that's why people have moved to Slack and uh, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp and text messaging and all those other things. They're far uh, more efficient ways to uh, to communicate. Um, and uh, so I think we're in this wave now where we're starting to throw away the history of the technologies that we utilize, even things like um slides like powerpoint slides why are they even called slides because they used to be cellophane slides that you would put in a slide projector to present your ideas uh out there and just imagine how much friction went into producing those slides so you didn't really care about how they were authored or whether they were dynamic but in today's universe they're all digital right who wants a static slide with just a couple bullets you need animation video and other stuff so we're starting to throw away all that stuff and evolve into a pure digital universe where we're not constrained by how things have evolved in the past, but we're really, um, you know, thinking towards the future and especially with mobile devices and ubiquitous connectivity um, that, you know, things can be, uh, you know, really dynamic and rich uh, to facilitate that productivity. I've got a buddy, uh, my industry is nightlife and one of my friends, Ray Chan, the owner and CEO of Candy Pants, he was pitching for his first event in Vegas. So he's going in and he's thinking, we're, all of us are very competent at what we do, but we're just small time British events creators. Why should some like huge time club owner of like Aria or XS or wherever he was in Vegas, listen to him. And they were brainstorming around how can we really sort of make an impact with this. So what they decided to do was get a specialist 360 a videography crew and film at all of their other events in Dubai, in Marbella, in the UK, elsewhere, um, on on the yacht at the Abu Dhabi F1, everything. And um, <clears throat> they rock up to this meeting, and it's in the you know seventy fifth floor of some beautiful hotel in Vegas or whatever. And the guys come in and they say, "Okay, Ray, like uh, let's crack on, man. Do you want to show us your show us your presentation?" And he pulls out a bunch of Oculus Go's, 
and puts them on top of all of the guys' heads. And then he starts talking through as they experience. They're looking around. They're in. They're on the yacht in Abu Dhabi. Then they change, and they're they're in the middle of a pool party in Marbella. Then it changes again, and they're in a nightclub in the UK. And um, yeah, when he told me that story, I was like, "Holy shit! This is really getting stepped up a notch, isn't it, for presentations?" Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a perfect example of how in today's world there are so many other options for how to convey and present ideas and collaborate on them uh, that are extremely efficient. Uh, for us. And if anything, the, the running into limits of like how much we can cognitively process as, as human beings, we, uh, we suffer from information overload and we need better tools to help streamline, uh, you know, what it is that we actually have to consume and, and make decisions on. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of the, what the technology can do, it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's amazing. It's just absolutely incredible. And that's a great story. Uh, that's a, that's a really that. fascinating point that you just made there, that we've gone from information scarcity to information surplus in probably 30 years. Yes. Like 30 years ago, I would have wanted to be able to access the entire history of the earth in a, on a device in my pocket. And then probably... Probably about the time that Instagram launched. No, maybe a little bit later. Maybe like 2012. 2012 was like maybe the sweet spot or 2010. And then it's just been like wildly overshot now. And you're right. A lot of what people's time is spent doing is not getting more information. It's actually filtering out information that they don't need and trying to permit themselves to focus on the essential few rather than the trivial many. My... My, the bane of my existence these days, and there's really been two systems, one, the calendar, which I'm sure we'll get into, but the second is email. I cannot stand that platform. It is incredibly inefficient. And it goes back to its roots, right? You know, with an email, all you need is an address in order to, to send a message to somebody. And it, it, it basically follows a moniker that every message is going to be read uh, and processed and filed. And I get now 300 messages a day, easy. Uh, and which means if I don't spend an hour managing my email, uh, then tomorrow I'm going to have 600 messages a day. It is incredibly inefficient because about 80% of these things are not things that are that important to me. Uh, it's not always obvious which ones are the important ones and which ones aren't. So it's very hard to use a traditional algorithm to just filter them all out. But uh, it's just the wrong you know, mechanism. You take Facebook as an example, not that, uh, you know, Facebook is, is perfect on any front, but the newsfeed basically recognizes that there's only so much time that I have to process information in a day with Facebook. So it's going to rank the information that um, I see to be the information that is most relevant to me. And I'm not even going to be aware of all of the newsfeed stories that it chose not to share with me. Uh, I'm only going to get the ones that the, the algorithm chose to to provide. Uh, now, in that case, that um, you know has some obvious consequences. But generally speaking, it's been extremely successful for uh, for Facebook. Imagine, uh, you know, if we're able to do that in uh, you know in in, in a, a business context or a work context, how much more efficient we will be. Uh, I think tools like Slack. Um, somewhat get there uh i don't have a lot of spam in slack for one because you can't just use my slack address to communicate with me you got to be in my slack group uh you have to be in the channels that i actually monitor and so that means that there's higher signal for me you still have the problem that there's slack overload but at least slack has more of a recency bias where uh that tool is basically designed for uh, synchronous communication if I miss a message that's really important, it's probably going to come back to me. So I'll just get another ping. And I don't need to go back and view every single Slack message that I didn't see in the three hours between I was last in the tool. Uh, so these, this gets to like what how productivity software needs to be built for the future. It needs to be really designed to fit um, a more efficient use of um, and sharing of information, uh, which uh, many tools, I think, really struggle with. Are we going to see email start to fade away i mean is there even really a, a a realistic alternative to the behemoth that is email at the moment i don't think it'll die uh but i think it, email is going to be it already is less relevant it's a lower signal uh mechanism you you see this uh 
you know, in the consumer space with things like social media, there, that information is not conveyed via email. It's conveyed via, you know, their, their own proprietary platforms and Instagram and WhatsApp and TikTok and, and other things. Uh, uh, these are not email based systems. In the professional environment, you've got Slack and Teams um, and now Zoom with Zoom chat, uh, which I think are getting uh, they're, they're bypassing the communication flow that is email. Email does provide one thing that nobody has solved yet, which is the global directory. If I have your email address, I can send you a message. And, um, you know, most of these other systems don't operate that way. Paradoxically, that's why they are effective, because they don't allow someone who is disconnected from me to communicate with me. But you still need that mechanism, uh, you know, because you want to be contacted by the recruiter or you want to be contacted by, um, you know, that business partner that you're going to have that is trying to get in contact with you to do something with your company. And if you don't have something like email to facilitate that, I think it's, um, uh, you know, that's that's still a detriment. So until that problem is solved, I think email will continue to exist. But it will become less and less relevant the more it's used. I mean, that's the paradox with it is, you know, as people start thinking this is a great way to talk about our products, um, they're destroying the platform that is, you know, had been a great way for people to communicate with each other. You're right. The ratio of noise to signal just continues to get worse and worse and worse. And anyone who's got a public facing email knows as well that one it's just trash it's a cesspool in there like this stuff like i i get randomly signed up to mailing lists someone's obviously seen that yeah. the, the the footer note on a website that's 15 years old still got like some email you know what i mean like it's just, it's a it's a nightmare um so i mean my my daughter is um 16 years old she's a high school senior uh she has problems with email right so uh, she she hates the the mechanism. It's very formal for her. She doesn't really understand how to use it. She grew up in text messaging, Snapchat. So email is like this weird thing. But uh, I mean, she's had trouble just filtering through the noise, even on her school email. And there's no spam there, at least spam as we would call it from advertisers. Nobody's contacting her via her school uh, uh, address to, to tell her to go buy, you know, Lululemons or whatever. Um, but she still gets way too much email from all of the distribution lists and all the communications from the school. And so the important stuff gets lost. The signal is lost. And, and, uh, and that's the problem with email is it doesn't provide a good ranking mechanism. Yeah, this is something that I wanted to get onto later, but I'm actually going to talk about it now, which is the relationship between your productivity system and everybody else's productivity system, that there is a an upper bound or there's a, a boundary on the domain of productivity that you can take your own system to as long as you have to interact with other people. And for instance, uh, you've used this example before about... Um, a finance department asking uh, particular salespeople to log all of their expenses, which took a hundred times more effort for the salespeople, but made it really slick for the finance department. And as anyone who's decided to venture down the productivity rabbit hole knows, your system can be as slick as you like. But if you are a doctor working for the NHS in the UK, you're on Windows 95 and fax. If you are part of any sort of big, well-established company that is going to take time to update their systems, the likelihood is they're not going to be able to have your Alfred auto snippet shortcut, like coded, preconceived idea macro system that you can just run. They're not. And so, yeah, the the marrying between the two and the the turmoil of knowing that you've got your shit sorted and that you now kind of have to slow yourself down to get to everyone else's pace is something I found really funny. This was um, the number one issue for Woven um, because the problem that we're looking to solve with calendars, um, it, time is like the most valuable asset that we have. And there's, there's only 24 hours in a day and in the work environment, it's usually more like 10. Uh, so it's a very precious resource. And the system that we use to manage time is generally very disconnected from, from the things that we're doing. You don't uh, actually use the calendar to, 
to like coordinate the agenda of a meeting. You'll have to use something else. Um, you don't use the calendar in many cases to even schedule. You will schedule over email, over text messaging. And then when you're done, you actually send the calendar invite from, from the calendaring system. So we were trying to fix that, or we are trying to fix that by addressing how the calendar is built because the calendar is just broken in terms of how it's built. And I can talk about that later if you want. Um, but, but going back to your point, we can come up with the most brilliant calendaring back end. If it doesn't interoperate with how other people work, it's either going to create a huge burden for them or they're just not going to uh, be able to interact with others. So the biggest technical challenge for Woven has been to build a system that is still compatible for the people that you're going to collaborate with on your events that aren't Woven users. It needs to synchronize with their existing systems and degrade gracefully in, in a way that um, will allow them to uh, to still interact and, and collaborate with you. And we put a lot of energy into that um, and it's you know worked, uh, I, I think, pretty effectively. But it is the hardest part, I think, for productivity software. Some uh, companies do what we've done, where they bootstrap on top of an existing um, technology. Uh, I mean, even Facebook uh, in a, the early days would use um, email for some uh, notification uh, updates. Uh, others like Slack just go and they rip the Band-Aid and they go straight into a completely different way of doing things. And uh, uh, they've been successful in that, uh, but it's hard. It's, it's really, really hard. Uh, this whole thing, I think, is... Uh, one of the tricks with productivity software is how do you interoperate so that your new system that you're using to make yourself more productive doesn't create an undue burden on the people that you work with. At the end of the day, um, if, it, if, if it doesn't work for everybody, for a group of people, then it doesn't really even work for you. Yeah, I agree, man. Let's go back to your, your time at Facebook. You doubled the productivity of the workforce at Facebook. How, what's the metric for that and how did that happen? Uh, we used revenue per employee, uh, and which is not the best measure, but it's very easy to benchmark, to look at other companies. Uh, and so um, we also looked at a couple of other measures. We would look at profit per employee. Uh, and then within each business function, you could provide more specific productivity measures like um, you know, how many uh, candidates can a sourcer produce or can a recruiter hire uh, in, a, in a given period of time. But at a, at a gross level, we use revenue per uh, employee. And that, that number where we talked about doubling the uh, productivity of, of the company uh, was very much based on uh, doubling revenue per employee. If we look at a different measure, we actually did even better. Um, uh, the the uh, a key strategy on this was, one, just a, an incredible focus on it. Like This was all my organization thought about was workforce productivity. Even things as like trite as the uh, uh, the gates that we would have, uh, the turnstiles that people would have to walk, walk through to come into the building, we looked at you know how much time it would take for someone to badge in and walk through, and in some cases we had to rebuild them because uh, it took you know an extra seventy five milliseconds. Uh, for the the badge reader to read a badge because of the distance between the badge and the badge reader. And so by moving the badge reader from underneath a plate of glass to on top of the plate of glass, we were able to get an improved throughput for people through those turnstiles. That's how much we cared about things. Um, and so when you got into things like, you know, how do employees meet with each other? We wanted a tool that was super easy so they didn't have to ask an admin. Um, how do people... Um, uh, you know, get uh, accessories. We invent these uh, vending machines that a lot of companies now have uh, where you could just badge into a vending machine if you needed keyboard mice, uh, batteries, uh, screen wipes, like anything that was technical. So you didn't have to go to the help desk for that. We could put these machines anywhere that employees were, even if we didn't have IT people. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly things like how do we make the business function like sales or recruiting? Um, more efficient through technologies uh you know facebook hires a lot of people and that's a lot of interviews um to find the right candidates at, at one point it was 37 interviews to hire one software engineer uh and so if you're going to hire 10,000 of them you can do the math in terms of how many interviews that that would require um so the uh you know we would build automation to take care of the mundane 
for people. Let's, let's make it so that it's really easy to schedule candidates. Let's make it really easy for people to do their performance reviews and, and to get feedback from other people within the company. Uh, and those were the, the mechanisms that we employed in order to uh, achieve those outcomes. Uh, and you know, over time, they really started to compound and build on themselves because we built a technical asset that we could then start using and reusing uh, to get more and more um, uh, capability into these functions. One of the co-hosts of the show, Johnny, he uh, he was a big four accountancy firm a few years ago, and he decided he'd gone through this long process, deciding he was going to leave and start his own business and become an entrepreneur, and it was his dream and blah blah blah. And um, he talks about the process that he went through to leave and it was he went to the terminal the console that he had on his computer went to r for resign press the resign button are you sure yes are you absolutely sure yes and that was it and I'm like, that was so good <laughs> you also said about um people automating stuff so i've got a story here a programmer wrote scripts to secretly automate his job so from this comes out the back end of GitHub, a guy called Narcos on GitHub. When he left his job, his former co-workers started looking through and realized that he'd automated all sorts of stuff. So this guy wrote one script that sends a text message late at work to his wife and automatically picks reasons from a preset list of them if his login activity was, was ever on the computer servers after 9 p.m. He wrote another script relating to a customer that he didn't like. It scans his inbox for an email from the customer and uses words like help, trouble, and sorry, and automatically rolls the guy's database to the last backup, then sends a reply, no worries, mate, be careful next time. With another script, he automatically fired off an email excuse like not feeling well working from home. If he wasn't at work logged in on the servers by 8.45, he called it the hangover script. And the best one, he wrote a script that waits exactly 17 seconds, then hacks into the coffee machine through the telephone terminal and orders it to start brewing a latte. The script tells the machine to wait another 24 seconds before pouring the latte into a cup, the exact time it takes to walk from the guy's desk to the, co the coffee machine. And his co-workers didn't even know the coffee machine on the network was hackable. That's the sort of shit that you need. That's the company you want. That's a good engineer. Uh, you know, I, th I think that the best engineers uh, are the lazy ones. They don't like to do uh, repetitive work, so they come up with mechanisms to avoid it, whether that's through architecture or through automation, like you just described. This is one of the things that made me successful when I was an intern at Sybase. My very first job was I thought the job was boring as hell, and so I just automated it. And uh, I took what used to take other people eight hours a day. I could get my job done in about two. So I had six hours to go screw around and do other things. And so they just kept giving me more work that I would just keep automating. Uh, and uh, But, you know, I'll, this is the trick, I think, with productivity. You sit and you find the repetitive things that do not add value to your life that you must do, and you automate them. That can be done through delegation to a subordinate or an assistant. That can be done through actually not doing them at all, um, I guess, which is the, the most beautiful part of your life when you realize the thing that you've been doing, no one's actually probably going to notice or it doesn't add, it adds so little value that you basically don't need to do it. Or as you say, yeah, write a script. So time management, what are the basic principles? Before we get into tools, what are the basic principles people should understand around time management? So one of the unique things about time is how limited it is. And I don't think people fully appreciate this. Um, and we use phrases like, you know, waste time um, or, you know, not having time. Uh, the reality is we do have time. We all have the same amount of time. Uh, and because time is so finite, you really have to be very diligent about how you choose to spend it. And this is where a calendar, I think, can be extremely valuable for uh, for people because what a calendar typically represents is how you want to spend your time, how you're planning to spend your time. And if you sit down and you think about it, like, you know, if you're, you know, if you have presentations to write or code to put to, to build or, um, you know, you need to, uh, you know, get through your email, uh, if you don't allocate the time for that, those activities, if you don't, you know, plan for it, then either it's not going to get done or it's going to get done at, at the expense of something else that 
uh, you may have uh, that's even more important because you're not being uh, diligent about it. So time management, I think, starts with respecting the fact that there's only so much time in a day. Uh, then the next key thing is to be very clear about what it is that you want to accomplish. What are your goals? Uh, and uh, you know, one of the, the greatest gifts in my life was uh, being uh, introduced to a, a life coach uh, early on in my career who helped me like write this stuff down. Like what were my big strategic goals in life? I, you know, when did I want to have kids? And when did I want, what kind of house did I want to live in? And when did I want to retire? And blah, blah. And basically you go from big to small. You, you start defining these things and then you can map that down into what do I need to do um, next next week, next, next month, next year. Uh, in fact, I, I still have one of the things that this guy had me do Hopefully you can see this is fill out this card. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's basically, this is your life is what the title of the card is. And it starts with like my birth year. And then I had to write out a hundred numbers until like uh, the age of 100. And then I had to circle where I was in my life at that time. Uh, he also had me circle when it is that I wanted to retire. And then uh, it helped me see like how little time I had left and it created urgency to make a make tough decisions on things that I was I wanted to spend time on. Uh, one of those things was I didn't want to be in the semiconductor industry, so I ended up resigning my job. I had a very lofty executive position, but I chose to leave that role because I didn't want uh, to you know retire from the semiconductor industry. I wanted to start my own company, and I wasn't going to do that working at, at this place. Um, and, uh, but you know, a number of other decisions came out of that. So once you have like those goals defined and then you narrow that down to how do I want to spend my time, you know, over the next quarter, uh, you can start building a normative schedule for yourself. Um, I, for example, I put, you know, Mondays are my favorite days of the week. I'm fresh. I relax from the week weekend, but it's very important for me to not immediately jump into collaborating with other people, but to have some strategic planning time. So the first two hours of my week are strategic planning time that I save for myself. And I almost never give that time up for somebody else. Um, I organize my week so that all the planning things are done Monday and Tuesday. So that means the rest of the week is mostly about execution. Um, my team has um, a commitment to each other that we're not going to spend time meeting on Wednesdays. That allows us all focus time. Uh, time to just get stuff done and uh, so on and so forth. So I've got a normative schedule that is pretty well defined and that helps me uh, to like meet my goals and time blocking and, and pre-allocating that time on the calendar is a very effective strategy to ensuring that you get done the things that are really important to you. Time blocking being just deciding in advance what you're going to spend hour X to hour Y doing. That's right. That's right. And it could be on a recurring basis. As I just described, I want to spend the first two hours of the week, like getting ready for the week, or it could be, uh, on a, you know, an as needed basis, I'm meeting with an investor on Thursday and I need to prepare the deck that I'm going to share with them. So I'm going to put an hour of time on Wednesday to finalize that. Um, it, you know, whatever it is, you get what you focus on. It can be on, on big things, uh, on, on recurring things where it can be, um, on tactical objectives that that you define but uh, the key point is you get what you what you focus on and time blocking allows you to be very deliberate about how you are going to focus your time yeah there's a, a few doorways to hell that i've got open in my mind one of them being uh parkinson's law work expands to fill the time given for it and i've been thinking recently about what happens when you scale parkinson's law in an information surplus world out across a lifetime like essentially what Parkinson's law does is probably push a lot of the important out of the way in place of the urgent. Uh, and you will just continue to kind of put out fires and put out fires and put out fires and never really get around to that. And it, that can be irritating over the micro slash immediate. It can be kind of worrisome over the medium term, but it's existential over the long term, right? Like, it it wouldn't surprise me if we get to the the stage where in 
20 years, 30 years time, people's biggest deathbed worries or regrets are stuff like I spent too much time on email. I spent too much time on my phone. Mm-hmm. You know, we haven't encountered that. There's, there's a lot of good articles. If you Google biggest um, regrets on, on deathbed, there's some really enlightening and, and, and sort of beautiful insights that nurses have got from that. But we haven't seen what the outcome is of this information overload world. And I'm, I'd bet a significant amount of money that stuff like social media and YouTube and email and digital work is absolutely going to make its way up that top chart hierarchy well, a, of regrets. There's another framework to think about time, which is that you have, um, I've heard some people use the, the words maker time and manage, manager time. Uh, maker time being the time where you're like doing something, you're, you're, uh, uh, your coding or your 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 authoring, uh, manager time being um, you're responding to the needs of others. You're um, uh, you're you're you know taking care of the things that that require collaboration. There's yet another way to look at that, which is your proactive time and your reactive time. You can't have none of the reactive time because um, the world is going to move on without you. Uh, and as much as we may want to have control over a hundred percent of what we do, things change and you need to spend time absorbing that and reacting to that. So you need to read the, you know, you need to go to the newsfeed, uh, but it's gotta be boxed. Uh, if it's too much of your time, then that's where those regrets are going to, to come about. Uh, the flip side of it is, is maker time. I would assert that most people don't, aren't deliberate about their maker time. Um, they don't think about where they are more productive. And there is definitely, um, you know, a, a Pareto here where it's, it's usually not even that much time, but 20% of our time produces 80% of our value. And when you're able to be disciplined and, um, and focused on that, you can maybe increase that a bit. So it's not just 20% of your time and improve your overall output. Uh, and this is what I think people like Mark Zuckerberg have been very effective at, um, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos, uh, Warren Buffett, all of these people are very, very good at managing their time. They're not flippant about it. Uh, then you have some others like Elon Musk who just don't sleep. So they've maximized their time in other ways. Um, but still same outcome. They're able to maximize their, their output from these things. And they're very jealous about the time that they need to think and, um, you know, be proactive about things. And, uh, the more that we can keep that in balance with the, uh, reactive time, I think then the more effective we are as individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. The send versus receive paradox that you've got going on there is, is super important. I can't remember the, yeah. I think it was another Jack Butcherism from Twitter where he said, uh, people spend their time like they can refund it and hoard their money like they could never get more. Uh, and we really do need to kind of flip that narrative on its head. And yeah, oh, absolutely. people being jealous to the point of paranoia about how they spend their time probably brings us more in line with where we all should be, I guess. Um, where do you see most people going wrong? They, so they think, right, I'm going to start optimizing my time. I'm really going to, that Tim guy sounds all right. He, he, he had some good stuff. Yeah. I don't want to die with regrets and unfulfilled dreams. What do some of the common errors people make? I think for one, not thinking far enough out into, uh, the future, uh, we can actually see this with calendar data. So what Woven's got about 190 million events in it. And one of the interesting things about that data set is it highlights most people don't fill their time until they don't schedule events until three days before the event occurs uh, or less. Uh, So that basically gives you a horizon for how far out in the future somebody is thinking. And uh, you know, the, uh, the, it, it, it basically highlights how reactive that we are. So I think that is a, a, a key th- area where we, we go wrong is that we don't plan far enough out in the future. We have a very uh, strong, uh, bias towards the, the here and now and not towards uh, the long term. You see this with things like 
you know, the best exercise advice isn't that, you know, okay, go start working out at the gym for, you know, 10 hours. It's, you know, work out the, at the gym every day for at least 20 minutes. Um, if you did that, you're going to be far better off in the long term because you're going to start to institute the habit. You're going to start coming back to it over and over. You're going to allow your body to adapt and, uh, and evolve. So we, we do too much of this cramming and not enough about thinking about the long-term implications of the uh, decisions that we make. Uh, and if we were to plan more our futures, uh, I think that we would be far more uh, likely to accomplish, but especially big things. Nothing worth doing is easy. And therefore, you're going to have to spend time on it, uh, but not just today, like over time. You really need to think about what am I doing next week, next month, next quarter? Uh, One of the addictions that I think a lot of people, myself included, have is this presumption that time spent planning could be spent working. So you have, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to put my plans together, I'm going to, you know, the next 90-day sprint or the next year or whatever it might be, um, and you start doing a bit of planning and an easy-to-do task appears during the planning process and you're like, oh, I can send that email now. And then before you know it, you've cut the planning stage short and tumbled into the rabbit hole of, of doing, and then it's urgent, and then information comes in, and then before you know it, the planning stage has been lost. And I, I really do, I, I wish that I had a better process for it, but I am absolutely a believer, although I'm not a member of the fact that, uh, that the cult that is trying to make long-term, you know, what is your obituary? What do you obituary, want your obituary to say? Um, what do you want to do in 25 years? When do you want to retire? Where do you want to be in five years' time? Where do you want to be in one year's time? And then really, because that's the only way that you can ensure that the actions that you take today are contributing to the future you want tomorrow. It's the only way that it works. But again, the urgent takes over the important and it stops us from spending that time, right? Like looking at what are the steps I need to take. And, you know, it's a this is a plea from me to anyone who's listening that tends to be a doer rather than a, a sit back and planner that, you, every minute of planning, I think, is probably worth 10 minutes of doing. And by spending a concentrated period of time, maybe two hours at the beginning of the week, like you said, or you know, once every month taking an entire day off to check in with your goals to do whatever, it feels like, oh, I'm going to have 600 emails to answer tomorrow and I'm going to have all of this other stuff to do. But in the big, big, big scheme of things, it's going to ensure that you continue pointing toward that North Star it's seductive because it, it feels good to get something done but there's a there's another hack on this that will that that uh i found uh helps greatly which is to spend time not just planning but also reflecting what did i get done so in addition to my two hours a week um or at, at the beginning of the week planning out what how i want the week to go every day i've got what are the goals that i have for today uh, and then at the end of the day, I look back, what did I get done? I write it down into my journal. Um, and uh, what is it that I want to get done tomorrow? And it does a couple things. It, wrote, it helps me see what I plan to do that I didn't get done. Why? Maybe it wasn't important or usually it's because I let the urgent take over the important. So how can I get that thing done? Um but also, I get the satisfaction of like looking at all the other all the things that I got done, uh, and it's usually more than I had planned to do. Um, and so, the learning is how to make sure that all the things that I planned to do got done. Um, but also, you know, to give myself a little bit of credit for the fact that I get a lot done. Like, there's a lot of things that I'll do in a day. Um, so when I just direct my abilities towards the things that I really care about. Um, you know, I will get both the satisfaction of getting things done, but it will be towards a master plan. All that stuff that I didn't plan to do is firefighting or, you know, responding to somebody else's needs. Um, and, you know, usually not particularly accretive to what my longer term goals are. Sometimes it is, but usually not. And uh, so it, I found that to be a very effective practice in, in helping to rem you know, both alleviate the desire to just check some boxes and, and say, yeah, I responded to those emails or I, you know, got through my email in a day and stay focused on those bigger picture items. 
is that a physical product? Is there a particular system that you're following for that? It seems like an oddly low tech solution for you. Yeah, it's uh, it's because this is less about um, the automation and more about the emotion, right? So that what what I have found with this is it doesn't necessarily feed the systems that I have that will automatically get stuff done. What it feeds is you know my my feelings about myself and and you know how I'm approaching my my day. So it doesn't really matter whether it is. Uh, in a note-taking app or it's on a piece of paper, I tend to be, you know, purely digital. So it's in a note-taking app. But even there, I could be in, you know, Apple Notes today and Notion tomorrow, and it really doesn't matter uh, because largely this is just a reminder for me of what my uh, key priorities are. I am thinking about other ways to get this into Woven because the calendar is reflective of this. Like, what is it? What's my goal for the day? Um, and how do we better incorporate that? And one of the things we have in Woven is um, analytics that I do use on a weekly basis to make sure that I'm spending time on the priorities that I care about. In fact, the, the mission of the company is help people spend time on what matters most. The analytics is part of how we help you do that. We'll give you visibility into how you're spending time. Scheduling is um, you know, a tool that we provide to help you spend time. Um, so are you spending time on what matters most at the end of the day? I can see, um, you know, through the analytics, how, how that's going and I'll, I'll have objectives in terms of how much time I want to spend with, um, you know, uh, the products, um, how much time I want to spend on growth marketing, how much time I want to spend on recruiting, how much time I want to spend on investors and they change, um, you know, based on where we are as a, as a team, but it's helpful for me to see, uh, how how that time is being allocated. Uh, and when I'm doing that planning at the beginning of the week, it can lead to adjustments. You know, I don't have enough emphasis on recruiting this week. I need to, you know, work with my recruiter and make sure that uh, either we're following up on candidates that we have that uh, are ready to go, or we're putting more people in the pipeline so that I'm spending time on recruiting because that's a big part of our growth. One of the things I've been impressed with a lot recently, and I think woven appears to be moving in a similar sort of direction is this post information world for a lot of personal productivity systems so i'm thinking about um the new era of wearables stuff like whoop and aura which actually don't they collect an awful lot of data but what they feed out is quite aggregated it's kind of simplistic it's really the minimum viable the mvi the minimum viable information uh, that you need to to get the work done and you know there's the the quantified selfers out there who would be perfectly happy to have every millisecond of data that they can plug into their excel spreadsheets with a v lookup and a color-coded cells and stuff but for the vast majority of people we're in and it, it reminds me kind of of the um the transition that we had with products from pre iphone to post iphone where when you used to get a blackberry it would come with like this telephone book of a manual and the unboxing wouldn't actually be that. And you'd have all this stuff and you'd never really need it. And you get it in like China, all the instructions would be Chinese, French, German, Dutch. Like I don't need all of that stuff. And then we get to, okay, what's the minimum viable information that people re uh, require? Like what is the most beautiful and, and smart user experience? And it would appear that the transition that you're trying to get to with calendar here, you know, it sounds great. I, I love the idea of spending time at the end of my week reviewing how I spent my, but it's like, if it's not there in front of me, that's just another task on my to-do list that I need to do. And as we've just identified, we have a bias toward doing things that are immediately gratifying rather than sitting, planning and reviewing. And yeah. unless it's there, slap bang, staring you in the face, and almost you need to like push notification out of the way, it's like it's just not going to get done. Does all of that kind of map into into your conception? This is why we we, we have this uh, concept of home uh, in Woven, and so the the home section of the app both shows you the meeting that you need to go to next. Um, but it also shows you your analytics for that particular week. And the reason we put it there is for exactly this purpose, that if it's, you know, of course, you're going to be looking there to like, what, do we, what is it that I have to do next? So it, you'll be reactive to that. You've already made those decisions. We're going to help you get into that event. Um, but uh, the analytics are the piece that you may not be thinking about. But when it's there, it's a constant reminder of, you know, what are your priorities and how are you performing against those priorities? 
And uh, so uh, by integrating things together into the calendar, we've made it easy for you. The, the alternative would be, you know, some people like they'll pay their executive assistants to go and, you know, build a report or there are some third party apps that you can plug into your calendar and they'll give you, um, you know, insights into your, your day. They're not real time. Um, and it's effort. And if you're going to have to spend that time uh, on it, you're much less likely to do it. When it's right there in front of you, then you can immediately consume that information. In fact, this is a whole principle in information management of cycle time to information. One of the ways to increase value is to give the information to people um, you know, is as quickly as it is collected as possible to reduce the cycle time to, uh, for, for information. And um, so that's something that we have uh, very much uh, strived to provide on this front. But there's a lot more. I mean, you, you also need trends. You need to know how is it, you know, it's one thing to know I'm spending 25 hours a week in video conferencing meetings. It's another thing to know that that has been slowly ticking up. And that's the reason why I'm tired. I feel tired because, um, you know, maybe for me, five hours a day is about as much as I can take before I start to just get exhausted staring at a computer screen all day long. Um, and, uh, you know, so when you have that insight, it can help then lead to actions on uh, how you might want to remediate that issue. Or maybe the, uh, the trend has been to spend less and less time on, on marketing. And, hey, that, may, that might be good for this particular company because the marketing issue is under control. Or maybe it's not. Maybe we're not performing from a marketing perspective. And so if I put more time into it, I will, I'll get better output on, on that front. In all cases, the point being that um, information is both like when it's easily collected and presented, that provides insight. But when you can also give you the context over time, uh, it provides a different level of insight. And both of them are really valuable. Yeah. Have you got plans to expand out to task management as well? Do you see the line between calendar, i.e. sort of time management and task management being difficult. So we, we spoke earlier on about um, the interdependence of your system with the people around you, but there's also interdependence within your existing systems, right? Yeah. yeah uh, t t basically, events are tasks. You know, the, we, we have a task right now. Let's go record a podcast. That is an event. We just both share it. A time block is a task. Um, so there is a very tight connection between those two things. Uh, and in many respects, Woven is actually already well suited for it because we have the concept of an event that has yet to be scheduled, uh, uh, a, a draft event, we call it. Um, and if we were to just call those draft events tasks, we'd have a task management system that's actually really, really powerful because any task inside of Woven could be done with other people and is collaborative and can easily then turn into an event on the calendar. And it can even do it by itself through uh, the magic of scheduling links. So that's in our future. There are some interesting things to address, especially when you get into groups. Because there's a lot of other places where people put tasks. They put tasks in their note-taking apps. They put tasks in systems like Asana um, or Git. Uh, they put, um, you know, they they may have full-on task management uh, systems if they're using a CRM. Uh, so we have to think through how to bridge, as we did with calendar events, this new universe where we're mapping those tasks to time and uh, the existing universe of where people in different organizations might want to be storing and managing their tasks. Uh, and that's, I think, probably the more tricky part of task management. But the other parts, in many respects, we've already solved. We just don't push that feature of the product just yet. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I had David Allen, the author of Getting Things Done and grandfather, I guess, of the modern productivity movement on a couple of months ago. And I asked him, I was like, you know, do you use, tell me, do you use OmniFocus or do you use Things 3 or have you got like a, what, what's your, the, and he was like, I'm just using this old as hell, like some Python script thing that looks like a Casio, uh, a Casio calculator. Uh, and that kind of really reminded me that the principles are served by the tool only for as long as the tool continues to be optimal. Like if you, people can make a, rod for their own back and actually create more work by getting a tool which is poorly aligned and doesn't necessarily do the job that it needs. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, it is. Uh, and this is, it's hard enough to build systems that are simple. I mean, you talked earlier about how it used to be you buy a piece of technology with a big thick book of uh, instructions on how to use it. And that's the world today will not accept a solution like that. You you have to build your technology in a way where it's easily discoverable. But simplicity is hard, right? It is difficult to build a, a powerful sim- system that is simple. It takes a lot of engineering, a lot of thought. Um, and so, uh, you know, th- this is one of our uh, current focuses is to take the power of woven and really try to uh, simplify how people can use and discover it so they don't necessarily have it all in their face, you know, on their, their first day when they come into the product, but it's still there. It's still there to, you know, provide value to them so we can automatically format events or automatically schedule events or whatever it is that the, the individual may, uh, may need. Uh, and you know, those, those problems are valuable, um, problems to address, which is one of the reasons why you don't want to expand your feature set too wide, too quickly so that you can make sure that you streamline things uh, that you have first. I was listening today to Lex Friedman on the artificial intelligence part. It's not called that anymore. It's just called the Lex Friedman podcast, but he's talking about artificial intelligence. (laughs) And he was talking about the fact that the first company to get an effective self-driving car will get a lot of the benefits that uh, the first AGI slash super intelligence will, because their ability to compound on the data and the analytics is going to just exponentially skyrocket their ability to further improve their system and further improve their system and further improve the learning. And it really seems like you guys are kind of mining that data to look at, you know, what what is it that people want? Because a lot of the time we don't even know what we want. You say to someone, oh, what's the, what are the sort of features that you would need in your new mobile phone or in your new whatever? And someone would rationalize what they think they want. And then you look at their usage and you're like, if I gave you that, you'd use it five times a year. Whereas if I did, if I managed to reduce this particular operation down by five seconds per time, it would save you fifty hours per year or more. You know, so yeah, it's um it's fascinating, man. I, I'm really interested to see how the analytics driven world is going to move into productivity. I think that's a, a really exciting area. Well, with time, we will further stitch together um, time, events, and what people are doing. This is. The long-term vision of the company uh, is to make time uh, an asset, an information asset. And it will be that when it's not isolated, when it's not all by itself. So when you know, you're going into your staff meeting and the agenda is already there and the follow-up action items are connected to the event. Uh, and uh, as we do that more and more, then those events can be smarter. You can start to see, oh, there's going to need to be a follow-up meeting out of this. So let me help you schedule that. Or um, maybe this, uh, you know, uh, event is going to, uh, you know, trigger the need to cancel something that you have in the future because you've just made the decision on something that was already planned in the future. Uh, the more that we do that, the more intelligent we can make the calendar and have it be a more proactive part of your day and your life where it's helping you to accomplish your goals as opposed to just being this administrative burden that you have to pay somebody else to manage. (laughs) Yeah, it really does feel, we talked about this kind of corner that we've turned with technology into the uh, information surplus age. It really does feel at the moment like that's what a lot of people want. Like the number of, there's no one listening who thinks that they have enough time in the day. Like the, the day that we're recording this, the clocks went back last night uh, sorry, the night the night before last night, and oh my god, a day with twenty five five hours in it. It was like it was so beautiful. I was like, I this is what this is what it should be like. But you know, I'm, I can't do that all the time. Sadly, I get that once. Sadly, a year. in four months, you're gonna have a day that. I know, I know. Yet. Don't remind us about that. <laughs> um, do you know that there's a, a statistically significant increase and decrease of twenty five percent in heart attacks and strokes on both of those days, and the same increase and decrease in road traffic accidents i'm not surprised that uh, i've never heard that statistic but i'm not surprised at all yeah from uh, this was my my number one challenge to my executive assistants at uh, both kla tencore and at facebook was um they'd say how can we help you most i was like i need a 36 hour day and for whatever <laughs> reason they all failed at it they could not i mean it's a simple thing just add 12 more hours to the day somehow they just the only time one of them figured it out was uh, apparently if I fly from Midway Island to Singapore, um, I can get 
I, I can get that 12 hours, Excellent. but it only happens once. It only happens yeah. once and then you yeah. got to lose it. I had a friend who set off on a flight from Hawaii to China. Um, uh, no, sorry, from Hawaii to Australia and lost Christmas Day. Set off on the twenty fourth, oh, yeah. arrived on the twenty sixth, and lost Christmas Day. And they had they had Christmas on the plane. Apparently, they had like the Christmas dinner, yeah. but never actually experienced what the twenty fifth of December felt like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, every time I'd fly back from Asia, that was the one nice thing is that you would get your time back. And, uh, so the travel day didn't exist on the way back. On the way there, you're screwed. You're wrecked. Yeah. Uh, look, Tim, thank you so much for coming on Woven dot com slash podcast slash wisdom if you want to go and check out woven 21 day free trial people can get at the moment is that right that's right hey your man knows it that's what happens when joel sends out the uh the script for the for the pre-roll uh so yeah go and check it out if this sounds like the sort of tool that you guys want to use i i am someone who schedules an awful lot you know four five guests per week plus all of the rest of the stuff i do for running multiple businesses and and everything else so i'm looking forward to sinking my teeth into the tool um and i'm fascinated man you know it's it's a really interesting time the technology is finally sort of permitting you guys to be able to do the things that you need to do hopefully to uh counteract the amount of information that we're all dealing with well, Chris, it's uh, been a pleasure to be on uh, your podcast here and uh, really look forward to seeing uh, some of your viewers uh, come uh, and check out Woven. And uh, uh, we offer, uh, in addition to uh, the 21 trial, 21 day trial, we also do some onboarding for our new users to help them learn about the app. And uh, very, very committed to the mission of the company to help people spend time on what matters most. I love it, Tim. Thank you, man.